Hello and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder and you can find this and everything we record at bnnforum.com, pieville.net, and at kirksvilletoday.com. Today we're going to conclude chapter 15, about 20 pages. This will be recording 23 of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, Russian Jew History. And we're now hearing about the Bolsheviks. We heard last time about how Jews he says they were it was a russian revolution not a jewish revolution but his data shows otherwise in my estimation and he certainly says that jews flock to take over not just the the central committee they're they're basically they're about half the executives but they're huge numbers of the lower apparatchik types and bureaucrats who are administering this murderous executionary sanguinary nasty communism into russia they're organized, they're pretty efficient, they're loyal, and they're full of energy. And these are the things you need when you're replacing the government. You know where you're headed, you're all on the same page, you're all in agreement, you got high spirits, and they have to do what they can to protect the revolution because it's still hated by the, the old time aristocrats in the country. It's not like by a lot of people outside the country, they have to conclude a peace with Germany to end their portion of World War I and get to consolidating and strengthening their revolution. So we're going to hear more about Lenin and the rest of these creeps. We begin with a new section on page 469, and this will run up to the end of chapter 15, which is about Jews alongside the Bolsheviks or Jews in the Bolsheviks. So about 20 pages up to 489, where the footnotes begin to end chapter 15. We'll start on page 469 of chapter 15. As I said, a new section. During all those months, Lenin was very much occupied with the climate of tension that had arisen around the Jewish question. As early as April of 1918, the Council of the People's Commissars of Moscow and the Moscow region, published in his Vestia 44, assuming that's not a footnote, thus for a wider audience than the region of Moscow alone, a circular addressed to the Soviets, again, Soviet means councils, quote, on the question of the anti-Semitic propaganda of the pogroms, which evoked, quote, events having occurred in the region of Moscow that recalled anti-Jewish pogroms. No city was named. It stressed the need to organize special sessions among the Soviets on the Jewish question and fight against anti-Semitism, as well as, quote, meetings and conferences. In short, a whole propaganda campaign. But who, by the way, was the number one culprit who had to have his bones broken? But the Orthodox priests, of course. The first point prescribed, quote, pay the utmost attention to the anti-Semitic propaganda carried out by the clergy take the most radical measures to stop the counter-revolution and the propaganda of the priests, unquote. We do not ask ourselves at this moment what these measures were, but in reality, who knows them better than we do? And again, it comes back to how you see the Jew, and whether it's a matter of opinion or not, the Christian view, we know the Catholic view, I've talked about that many times, is that Jews are rejectors of Jesus, and that defines them. There's no racial problem with them. It's simply that they reject the Jew, and that turns them into revolutionaries. Now, to proclaim this, to promulgate this doctrine, to push this ideology, the Catholic has to ignore the fact that Jews acted as nasty criminal revolutionaries long before Jesus was ever heard of, long before he ever dripped out of the inkwell of a fountain pen, Jews were nasty revolutionaries. But the Catholic, again, is doing an ideology. He's not interested in the truth. He's interested in his ideology, just exactly the same as the SJWs and their wokeness today or the communists back then. Where reality is out of conformance with ideology, reality gets buried. It's driven out. And that's true for Catholicism. It's true for communism, and it's true for wokeism. It's true for everything that is an ideology. Ideology is used loosely by people to mean scheme or plan or belief system, but 
I use it in the way that it's inherently invalid because it rejects reality. And I only use it to describe things that absolutely reject reality for their belief system. In my opinion, no belief system should include things that are anti that are that that fight reality. It should work with reality. It should acknowledge reality. There is a reality. It, there is an objective truth. There is not a god. Which itself is a matter of reality, uh, but there is an objective truth. There is objective reality, and no thinking that covers up or denies reality is valid. That's my point of view. So what is a Jew is the first question. Now, he's certainly not going to go into this. What he is doing is literally history. It's not philosophy. But anyway, the Orthodox view is going to be essentially the same as the Catholic, which is that there's no racial problem with the Jew. You just have to convert him to Christianity and all the problems will go away. I will say parenthetically, and my God, he has his, he, his book is full of parentheses. Even where you get large numbers of Jew converts, there, that's always followed by a special word in Spanish or Portuguese or Arabic that describes those converts because they continue to act the same, which is a key, a big clue that it's race and it's not religion. The Jewish religions, such as it is, comes from the race. The religion doesn't make the race, it confirms the race, it articulates it, it helps it, it kind of ratchets it up. But the race and its behavior was there from day one and doesn't need to be articulated because it's actually practiced. Anyway, after that little discursus. Then point number two recommended, quote, to recognize the necessity did not create a separate Jewish fighting organization, unquote. At the time, a Jewish guard was being considered. The point number four, uh, where did point number three go? Entrusted the Office of Jewish Affairs and the War Commissariat with the task of, quote, taking preventive measures to combat anti-Jewish pogroms. At the height of the year, the same year, 1918, Lenin recorded on a gramophone a, quote, special discourse on anti-Semitism and the Jews. He there denounced Quote, the cursed czarist autocracy, which had always launched uneducated workers and peasants against the Jews. The czarist police, assisted by landowners and capitalists, perpetrated anti-Jewish pogroms. Again, this is what we heard in the earlier chapters dealing with Kishinev and Gamal and, uh, and other places of pogroms, that they were directed by the top down, even though there was never any evidence of that. There was evidence of lax policing and and long-running hatred between Jews and, and uh, Russians, but there was never any evidence that any of this was directed by the top down. If anything, the czar, etc., and the police were ineffectual, but that didn't stop the Jews from spreading that lie internationally to black and Russia's reputation and even inventing telegrams and letters and communications uh, <coughs> to further their lie. So again, the czarist police, assisted by landowners and capitalists, perpetrated anti-Jew pogroms, claims Lenin on a gramophone, a recording. Hostility toward the Jews is perennial only where the capitalist cabal has definitely obscured the minds of the workers and the peasants. Actually, the capitalists were often Jewish themselves, as we've heard about their domination of sugar and wheat and timber. And of course, in America, the financiers are Jews, mainly, setting up the central bank around this time, the Federal Reserve, and they are funding this revolution. So they're hardly against communism. They work with it. But they're going to blame these anonymous, non-Jewish capitalist cabal for obscuring the minds of the workers and the peasants. There are among the Jews workmen, men of labor. They are the majority. Not true. They're mostly traitors. They are our brothers, oppressed as we are by capitalism. They are our comrades who struggle with us for socialism. Shame on the cursed czarism. Shame on those who sow hostility toward the Jews. Quote, recordings of this speech were carried all the way to the front, transported through towns and villages abroad, special, aboard special propaganda trains which crisscrossed the country. Gramophones spread this discourse in clubs, meetings, assemblies. Soldiers, workers, and peasants listened to their leaders harangue and began to understand what this was all about. But this speech at the time was not published by intentional omission, 
asked Solzhenitsyn. It was only so in uh, 1926 in the book of Agursky Sr., A-G-U-R-S-K-Y. On 27 July 1918, just after the execution of the imperial family, the Sovnarkom, S-O-V-N-A-R-K-O-M, promulgated a special law on anti-Semitism. Quote, the Sovnarkom, the law on anti-Semitism, quote, the Soviet of the People's Commissars declares that any anti-Semitic movement is a danger to the cause of the revolution of the workers and the peasants, even though Jews are neither workers nor peasants. Jews always speak in the name of all other groups. In conclusion, from Lenin's own hand, Luna Charsky tells us, quote, The Sovnarkom directed all Soviet deputations to take radical measures to eradicate anti-Semitism. The inciters of pogroms, those who propagate them, will be declared outlaws. Signed, V.I. Ulyanov, or Lenin. If the meaning of the word outlaw may have escaped some, of the, some at the time, in the months of the Red Terror it would appear clearly, ten years later, in a sentence of a communist militant, Larine, who was himself for a while the commissar of the people and even the promoter of, quote, war communism, colon, to outlaw the active anti-Semites was to shoot them. So he's saying anyone who shows any anti-Semitism should be shot. That's what outlawing anti-Semitism means, says Solzhenitsyn. And then there is Lenin's famous reply to Diamondstein in 1919. Lenin's famous reply to Diamondstein, D-I-M-A-N-S-T-E-I-N, or S-H-T-E-I-N. Even in the same translation, things are variously spelled. Diamondstein, quote, wished to obtain from Lenin that he be retained that be retained the distribution of Gorky's tract containing such praises to the address of the Jews that it could create the impression that the revolution was based only on the Jews and especially on the individuals from the middle class. Lenin replied, as we have already said, that immediately after October, it was the Jews who had saved the revolution, says Lenin. It was the Jews who had saved the revolution by defeating the resistance of the civil servants, and consequently, Gorky's opinion was perfectly correct. So all these Jews rushing in, often from abroad, to take over civil positions and run the new government, saved the revolution, says Lenin. The Jewish encyclopedia does not doubt it either. Quote, Lenin refused to sweep under the carpet the extremely pro-Semite proclamation of M. Gorky, and it was disseminated in great circulation during the Civil War, in spite of the fact that it risked becoming an asset in the hands of the anti-Semites, who were enemies of the revolution. And it became so, of course, for the whites who saw two images merge. That is the resistance, the, the anti-Jewish Bolsheviks called the white Russians, who saw two images merge, that of Judaism and that of Bolshevism. Hence the German National Socialist term Judeo-Bolshevismus, Jewish Bolshevism. One word or hyphenated in, in Anglo. In English it should be hyphenated in theirs. I think it was one word. The surprising, short-sighted indifference of the Bolshevik leaders to the popular sentiment and the growing irritation of the population is blatant when we see how much Jews were involved in repression directed against the Orthodox clergy. It was in summer 1918 that it was initiated the assault on the Orthodox churches in central Russia, and especially in the Moscow region, which included several provinces, an assault which only ceased thanks to the wave of rebellions in the parishes. And it's not so much the churches they don't like, in my opinion, it's that this could be a point of organizing resistance by whites against the Jews. The attack is racial. Don't let the religion confuse you. In January 1918, the workers who were building the fortress of Kronstadt rebelled and protested. The executive committee of the party, composed, quote, exclusively of non-natives, unquote, had designated for guard duty, instead of militia, Orthodox priests, while, quote, not a Jewish rabbi, not a Muslim mullah, not a Catholic pastor, nor a Protestant pastor was put to use. Let us note in passing that even on this small fortified island of the, quote, prison of the peoples, unquote, there were places of worship for all the confessions. A text entitled, quote, Charge on the Jews, exclamation point, 
charge on the Jews appeal, appeared even all the way to the Pravda, a call from the workers of Archangelsk, Archangelsk, remember that's where the, I think the British and the Americans put an expeditionary force, World War I, quote, anyway, there's a call that appeared all the way even under the Pravda to Russian workers and peasants conscious of their fate, in which they read, quote, our profane, defiled, plundered, exclusively Orthodox churches, never synagogues, death by hunger and disease carries hundreds of thousands of innocent lives among the Russians, while, quote, the Jews do not die of hunger or disease. And notice the American, uh, Anglo-American conservatives will never talk about well, if they're atheist Jews, and the, the point is they're atheists and not Jews, well, why are they going after only white, relig uh, white, white religious places, but never Jewish religious places? This is a point the Russians are making, too. There was also, during the summer 1918, a criminal case of anti-Semitism in the Church of Basil the Blissful in Moscow. What madness on the part of Jewish militants to have mingled with the ferocious repression exerted by the Bolsheviks against orthodoxy, even more fierce than against the other confessions, with this persecution of priests, with this outburst in the press of sarcasms aimed at the Christ. The Russian pens also zealously attacked Demian Bedny, Efim Pridvarov, for example, and he was not the only one. I have no idea who he is. Yes, the Jews should have stayed out of it. Again, he can't, he simply can't interpret the data. It's that Jews hate the white race. It's not that they hate a religion they, after all, created and spread. Christianity. It's again that old Steve Martin, they're shooting at the barrels. No, they're shooting at you. On 9 August 1919, Patriarch Tikhon, T-I-K-H-O-N, wrote to the president of the Vitsik Kalinin with a copy to the Sovnarkom president, Ulyana of Lenin, to demand the dismissal of the investigating magistrate, Chipitsburg, in charge of the, quote, affairs, unquote, of the church, quote, a man who publicly outrages the religious beliefs of people, who openly mocks ritual gestures, who, in the preface to the book, The Religious Plague, 1919, gave Jesus Christ abominable names and thus profoundly upset my religious feeling. The text was transmitted to the small Sovnarkom, from which came the reply on 3 September, quote, classify the complaint of citizen Bellavine, or Patriarch Tikhon, without follow-up. But Kalanin changed his mind and addressed a secret letter to the Justice Commissioner, Krasikov, saying that he believed that, quote, for practical and political considerations, replace Chipitsburg with someone else, unquote, given that, quote, the audience in the court is probably in its majority orthodox, and that it is therefore necessary, quote, to deprive the religious circles of their main reason for ethnic revenge. And what about the profanation of relics? How could the masses understand such an obvious outrage, so provocative? Quote, could the Russians, the Orthodox, have done such things? They asked each other across Russia. Quote, all that, it is the Jews who have plotted it. It makes no difference to those who crucified Christ. And who is responsible for this state of mind, if not the Bolshevik power, by offering to the people spectacles of such savagery? S. Bulgakov, who followed closely what happened to orthodoxy under the Bolsheviks, wrote in 1941, Bulgakov, B-U-L-G-A-K-O-V, quote, he wrote in 41, in the USSR, the persecution of Christians, quote, surpassed in violence and amplitude all previous persecutions known throughout history. Of course, we should not blame everything on the Jews, but we should not downplay their influence. Quote, were manifested in Bolshevism, above all, the force of will and the energy of Judaism. Quote, the part played by the Jews in Bolshevism is, alas, disproportionately great. And it is, above all, the sin of Judaism against Ben Israel. And it is not the sacred Israel, but the strong will of Judaism that, in power, manifested itself in Bolshevism and the crushing of the Russian people. Quote, although it derived from the ideological and practical program of Bolshevism, without distinction of nationality, the persecution of Christians found its most zealous actors among Jewish commissioners of militant atheism, and to have put a Gubelman, Lero Slavsky, at the head of the Union of the Godless, was to commit, quote, in the face of the Russian Orthodox people, an act of religious effrontery. <laughs> 
Another very ostensible affrontery, quote, this way of rechristening cities and places, custom in fact less Jewish typically than Soviet. But can we affirm that for the inhabitants of Gatchina, the new name of their city, Trotsk, did not have a foreign residence? Likewise for Pavlovsk, now Slutsk, Yuritsky gives its name to the square of the palace, Vorovsky to the St. Isaac Plaza, Volodarsky to the prospect of the founders, Nakimson to the St. Vladimir prospect, Rochal to the barge of the Admiralty, and the second-class painter Isaac Brodsky gives his name to the beautiful St. Michael Street. They could no longer stand each other. Their heads were turning. Through the immensity of Russia, it flashes by. Elizabethgrad becomes Zinoviesk. And let's go boldly. The city where the Tsar was assassinated takes the name of the assassin, Sverdlovsk. It is obvious that was present in the Russian national consciousness as early as 1920, the idea of a national revenge on the part of Bolshevik Jews, since it even appeared in the papers of the Soviet government. It served as an argument to Kalinin, or Kalinin. Of course, Pasmanik's refutation was right. Quote, For the wicked and narrow-minded, everything could not be explained more simply. The Jewish Kahal has decided to seize Russia, or it is the revengeful Judaism that settles its accounts with Russia for the humiliations undergone in the past. Of course, we cannot explain the victory and the maintenance of the Bolsheviks, but if the pogrom of 1905 burns in the memory of your family, and if in 1915 you were driven out of the Western territories with the strikes of a whip, your brothers by blood, you can very well, three or four years later, want to avenge yourself in your turn with a whip or revolver bullet. We are not going to ask whether communist Jews consciously wanted to take revenge on Russia by destroying, by breaking the Russian heritage, but totally denying this spirit of vengeance would be denying any relationship between the inequality and in rights under the Tsar and the participation of Jews in Bolshevism, a relationship that is constantly evoked. Why would Jews have any rights at all? Why would you allow them to live in your country? This is a question that's never raised and can, and has no answer except the obvious. You wouldn't. And this is how I am Beekerman, B-I-E-K-E-R-M-A-N, we've heard from him before, confronted with, quote, the fact of the disproportionate participation of the Jews in the work of barbaric destruction, unquote, to those who recognize the right of the Jews to avenge past persecutions refutes this right refutes this right. Quote, the destructive zeal of our co-religionists is blamed on the state who, by its vexations and persecutions, would have pushed the Jews into the revolution. Well, no, he says, for, quote, it is to the manner in which an individual reacts to the evil suffered that he is distinguished from another, and the same is true of a community of men. And again, they didn't suffer that much. They actually had special privileges legally. Later, in 1939, taking in the destiny of Judaism under the black cloud of the coming new era, the same Beekerman wrote, quote, The great difference between the Jews and the world around them was that they could only be the anvil and never the hammer. Yeah, after they kill tens of millions, huh? I do not intend to dig here in this limited work, says Solzhenitsyn, the great historical destinies, but I am expressing a categorical reservation on this point. Perhaps this was so since the beginning of time, but as of 1918 in Russia, and for another 15 years, the Jews who joined the revolution also served as a hammer, at least a large part of them. Wow, he's actually daring to... Clearly, they were, they were always the ones who were hammering on others, and what others did was a response to what they did. Here, in our review, comes a voice of Boris Pasternak. In his Dr. Zhivago, he writes, it is true, after the Second World War, thus after the cataclysm which came down, crushing and sinister, over the Jews of Europe and which overturned our entire vision of the world, false, but in the novel itself is discussed the years of the revolution. He speaks of, quote, this modest, sacrificial way of remaining aloof, which only engenders misfortune, of, quote, their, i.e. the Jews, fragility and their inability to strike back. Yet did we not both have before us in the same country at different ages, certainly, but where we lived in the same 20s and 30s? The contemporary of those years remains mute with astonishment. Pasternak would thus not have seen, I believe, what was happening. 
he's saying, well, why doesn't he talk about how they were killing people in his novel? His parents, his painter father, his pianist mother, belonged to a highly cultivated Jewish milieu, living in perfect harmony with the Russian intelligentsia. He himself grew up in a tradition already quite rich, a tradition that led the Rubenstein brothers, the moving Levitan, the subtle Gurchin's son, the philosophers Frank and Chestov, to give themselves to Russia and Russian culture. It is probable that this unambiguous choice, that perfect equilibrium between life and service, which was theirs, appeared to Pasternak as the norm, while the monstrous gaps, frightening relative to this norm, did not reach the retina of his eye. Oh, he's just not telling the truth, is what it would be. On the other hand, these differences penetrated the field of view of thousands of others. Thus witness of these years, Beekerman writes, quote, the too visible participation of the Jews in the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Saturnalia, that's a good word for it, attracts the eyes of the Russians and those of the whole world. No, says Solzhenitsyn, the Jews were not the great driving force of the October coup. The latter, moreover, brought them nothing since the February Revolution had already granted them full and complete freedom. But after the coup de force took place, it was then that the younger Laic generation quickly changed horses and launched themselves with no less assurance into the infernal gallop of Bolshevism. They joined it as the party hacks and the enforcers and the new civil, civil uh, servants. Obviously, it was not the Melamides that produced this, but the reasonable part of the Jewish people let itself be overwhelmed by hotheads, and thus an almost entire generation became renegade, and the race was launched. Yeah, well, if they're all doing it, that is the normal. There, he's Again, he's trying to posit some Jew that exists apart from actual Jews, a good Jew or an average Jew that isn't a Bolshevik, but it's not there. G. Landau looked for the motives that led the younger generation to join the camp of the new victors. He writes, quote, Here was the rancor with regard to the old world and the exclusion of political life and Russian life in general, as well as a certain rationalism peculiar to the Jewish people, and, quote, willpower, which, in mediocre beings, can take the form of insolence and ruthless ambition. Some people seek an apology by way of explanations. Quote, the material conditions of life after the October coup created a climate such that the Jews were forced to join the Bolsheviks. This explanation is widespread. Quote, 42% of the Jewish population of Russia were engaged in commercial activity, they lost it. They found themselves in a dead-end situation. Where to go? Quote, in order not to die of hunger, they were forced to take service with the government without paying too much attention to the kind of work they were asked to do. That's just obvious lies. It was necessary to enter the Soviet apparatus where, quote, the number of Jewish officials from the beginning of the October Revolution was very high. Close quote. They had no way out? Did the tens of thousands of Russian officials who refused to serve Bolshevism have somewhere to go? To starve? But how were living the others? Especially since they were receiving food aid from organizations such as the Joint, the ORT, financed by wealthy Jews from the West. So it, what the, that Jew was claiming is the exact opposite of the truth. The Russians are the ones who had no options. The Jews had plenty of options. They're fed and given money by foreigners, and they're getting uh, jobs in the new Bolshevik regime. Enlisting in the Cheka was never the only only way out. There was at least another, do not do it, to resist. But I disagree. They're not renegades. They're just average Jews doing this. The result, Pasmanic concludes, moving on to 475, is that Bolshevism became, for the hungry Jews of cities, a trade equal to the previous trades, tailor, broker, or apothecary. But if this is so, it may be said 70 years later, in good conscience, for those, quote, who did not want to immigrate to the United States and become American, who did not want to immigrate to Palestine to remain Jews, for those, the only issue was communism, unquote. Again, the only way out? It is precisely this, in italics, that is called renouncing one's historical responsibility. Jews are trying to run away from the fact that they created the Bolshevik Revolution and they were the ones who benefited from it, and they murdered all kinds of other people in its name. Other arguments have more substance and weight. Quote, a people that has suffered such persecution, unquote, and this throughout its history, 
unquote, could not, in its great majority, not become bearers of the revolutionary doctrine and internationalism of socialism. For it, quote, gave all its Jewish followers the hope of never again being pariahs on this very earth, and not, quote, in the chimerical Palestine of the great ancestors. Further on, quote, during the Civil War already, and immediately afterwards, they were stronger in competition with the newcomers from the ethnic population, and they filled many of the voids that the revolution had created in society. In doing so, they had for the most part broken with their national and spiritual tradition, unquote, after which, quote, all those who wanted to assimilate, especially the first generation, and at the time of their massive apparition, took root in the relatively superficial layers of a culture that was new to them. One wonders, however, how it is possible that, quote, the centuries-old traditions of this ancient culture have proved powerless to counteract the infatuation with the barbaric slogans of the Bolshevik revolutionaries. When, quote, socialism, the companion of the revolution, melted onto Russia, not only were these Jews, numerous and dynamic, brought to life on the crest of the devastating wave, but the rest of the Jew people found itself deprived of any idea of resistance and was invited to look at what was happening with a perplexed sympathy, wondering, impotent, what was going to result from it. How is it that, quote, in every circle of Jewish society, the revolution was welcomed with enthusiasm and inexplicable enthusiasm when one knows of what disillusionments composed the history of this people? Again, these are direct quotes. How could the, quote, Jewish people, rationalist and lucid, allow itself to indulge in the intoxication of res revolutionary phraseology? D.S. Pasmanic evokes in 1924, quote, those Jews who proclaimed loudly and clearly the genetic, between, the genetic link between Bolshevism and Judaism. In 1924, quote, those Jews who proclaimed loudly and, who proclaimed loudly and clearly the genetic link between Bolshevism and Judaism, who openly boasted about the sentiments of sympathy which the mass of the Jewish people nourished toward the power of the commissioners. At the same time, Pasmatic himself pointed out, quote, the points which may at first be the foundation of a rapprochement between Bolshevism and Judaism, these are the concern for happiness on earth and that of social justice. Judaism was the first to put forward these two great principles. We read an issue of the London newspaper Jewish Chronicle of 1919 when the revolution had not yet cooled down, an interesting debate on the issue. The permanent correspondent of this paper, a certain mentor, M-E-N-T-O-R, capital M, name, writes that it is not fitting for the Jews to pretend that they have no connection with the Bolsheviks. Thus, in America, the rabbi and doctor Judah Magnus, M-A-G-N-E-S, supported the Bolsheviks, which means that he did not regard Bolshevism as incompatible with Judaism. He writes again the following week, Bolshevism is in itself a great evil, but, paradoxically, it also represents the hope of humanity. Was the French Revolution not bloody? It as well, and yet was justified by history. The Jew is idealistic by nature, and it is not surprising. It is even logical that he believes the promises of Bolshevism. Quote, there is much room for reflection in the very fact of Bolshevism, in the adherence of many Jews to Bolshevism, in the fact that the ideals of Bolshevism, in many respects, join those of Judaism, a great number of which have been taken up by the founder of Christianity. The Jews who think must examine all this carefully. One must be foolish to see in Bolshevism only its off-putting aspects. All the same, is not Judaism above the recognition of the one God? But this in itself is enough to make it incompatible with Bolshevism, the denier of God. Again, there you have it, that's Christian ideology. He cannot see Jews as a race. He never considers it once so far in 500 pages. But he should, because that is the way to understand. That's what. That's why... Judaism and Bolshevism can be the exact same thing. It doesn't matter what you believe. Jude Jews are a race. Still, still on the search for the motives for such a broad participation of the Jews in the Bolshevik adventure, I. Beekerman writes, quote, We might, before the facts, despair of the future of our people if we did not know that, of all the contagions, the worst is that of words. 
Why was the Jewish consciousness so receptive to this infection? The question would be too long to develop here, close quote. The causes reside, quote, not only in the circumstances of yesterday, but also, quote, in the ideas inherited from ancient times, which predisposed Jews to be contaminated, contaminated by ideology, even if it is null and subversive. So again, these portraying Jews as a victim rather than creators and spreaders. It wasn't a Goy who thought up communism, and it wasn't Goy's who put it into practice. It was Jews. S. Bulgakov also writes, quote, The face that Judaism shows in Russian Bolshevism is by no means the true face of Israel. It reflects, even within Israel, a state of terrible spiritual crisis, which can lead to bestiality. As for the argument that the Jews of Russia have thrown themselves into the arms of the Bolsheviks because of the vexations they have suffered in the past, it must be confronted with the two other communist shows of strength that occurred at the same time as that of Lenin, in Bavaria and in Hungary. We read in I. Levin, quote, The number of Jews serving the Bolshevik regime is, in these two countries, very high. In Bavaria, we find among the commissaries the Jews E. Levin, M. Levin, Axelrod, the anarchist ideologist, ideologist Landauer, Ernst Toller. The proportion of Jews who took the lead of the Bolshevik movement in Hungary is of 95%. However, the situation of the Jews in terms of civic rights was excellent in Hungary, where there had been not been any limitation for a long time already. So they've been blaming on how Russia treated them, but even where they have more than equal rights, they're still communist revolutionaries. Communism is what Jews do to non-Jews. In the cultural and economic sphere, the Jews occupied such a position that the anti-Semites could even speak of a hold of the Jews. We may here add the remark of an eminent Jewish publisher of America. He writes that the Jews of Germany, quote, have prospered and gained a high position in society, close quote. Let us not forget in this connection that the ferment of rebellion that was at the origin of the coup de force, of which we shall speak again in chapter 16, had been introduced by the Bolsheviks throughout the, through the intermediary of, quote, repatriated prisoners, unquote, stuffed with propaganda. What brought all these rebels together, and later beyond the seas, was a flurry of unbridled revolutionary internationalism, an impulse towards revolution, a revolution that was global and, quote, permanent, unquote. The rapid success of the Jews in the Bolshevik administration could not be ignored in Europe and the United States. Even worse, they were admired there. At the time of the passage from February to October, Jewish public opinion in America did not mute its sympathies for the Russian Revolution. Again, it's a racial thing, and he never yet even considers it to reject it. And that's that's common among Christians. They simply use their ideology and everything else goes out the window. They ignore it. New section, page 477. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviks were conducting their financial operations diligently abroad, mainly via Stockholm. Since Lenin's return to Russia, secret supplies had come to them of German provenance through the Nia Banken of Olaf Ashberg. This did not exclude the financial support of certain Russian bankers, those who, fleeing the revolution, had sought refuge abroad, but had transformed there into voluntary support of the Bolsheviks. An American researcher, Anthony Sutton, has found, with a half-century of de delay, archival documents he tells us that if we are to believe a report sent in 1918 to the State Department by the U.S. ambassador in Stockholm, quote, among these Bolshevik bankers is the infamous Dmitry Rubinstein that the revolution of February had gotten out of prison, who had reached Stockholm and made himself the financial agent of the Bolsheviks, close quote. Quote, we also find Abram Jivotovsky, a relative of Trotsky and Lev Kamenev, Abram Jivotovsky. So all their Jew relatives abroad who are in banking are particularly useful to them. Among the syndicates were Denisov of the ex-Bank of Siberia, Kamenka of the bank Azov-Don, the River Don, and Davidov of the Bank for Foreign Trade. 
other Bolshevik bankers, Grigory Lessine, Tifter, Ayakov Berlin, and their agent Isidore Kohn. They had left Russia. These had left Russia. Others in the opposite direction left America to return. They were the revenants, all of them, quote, revolutionaries, unquote, some from long ago, others of recent date, who dreamed of finally building and consolidating the new world of universal happiness. We talked about it in chapter 14. They were flocking across the oceans from the port of New York to the east, or from the port of San Francisco in the direction of the west, some former subjects of the Russian Empire, others purely and simply American citizens, enthusiasts who did not even know the Russian language. In 1919, A.V. Tirkova Williams wrote in a book published then in England, quote, There are few Russians among the Bolshevik leaders, few men imbued with Russian culture and concerned with the interests of the Russian people, in addition to foreign citizens, Bolshevism recruited immigrants who had spent many years outside the borders. Some had never been to Russia before. There were many Jews among them. They spoke Russian badly. The nation of which they had become masters was foreign to them, and, moreover, they behaved like invaders in a conquered country. And if, in Tsarist Russia, quote, Jews were excluded from all official posts, if schools and state service were closed to them, on the other hand, the Soviet Republic, all committees and commissariats were filled with Jews. Often they exchanged their Jewish name for a Russian name, but this masquerade did not deceive anyone. That same year, at 1919, at the Senate hearings of the Overmen Commission, O-V-E-R-M-E-N, Overmen Commission, Senate hearings of the Overmen Commission, and Illinois University professor P.B. Dennis, who arrived in Russia in 1917, declared that, in his opinion, quote, an opinion that matched that of other Americans, Englishmen, Frenchmen, these people deployed in Russia an extreme cruelty and ferocity in their repression against the bourgeoisie. The word is used here without any pejorative nuance in its primary sense, the inhabitants of the boroughs. Or, quote, among those who carried out murderous propaganda in the trenches and in the rear, there were those who, one or two years before, i.e. in 1917, 1918, still lived in New York. In February 1920, Winston Churchill spoke in the pages of the Sunday Herald in an article entitled Zionism Against Bolshevism, Struggle for the Soul of the Jewish People. He wrote, quote, Today we see this company of outstanding personalities emerging from clandestinity from the basements of the great cities of Europe and America who grabbed by the hair and seized by the throat the Russian people and established itself as the undisputed mistress of the immense Russian Empire. There are many known names among these people who have returned from beyond the ocean. Here is M. M. Grusenberg. He had previously lived in England, where he had met Sun Yat-sen, the Chinese, then lived for a long time in the United States in Chicago, where he had, quote, organized a school for the immigrants, unquote, and we find him in 1919, general consul of the RSFSR. In Mexico, general consul for the RSFSR in Mexico, a country in which the revolutionaries founded great hopes, Trotsky would turn up there. Then, in the same year, he sat in the central organs of the Comintern. He took service in Scandinavia, Sweden. He was arrested in Scotland. He resurfaced in Jesus Christ in China in 1923 under the name Borodan, Borodin, with a whole squad of spies. He was the, quote, principal political advisor to the executive committee of the Kuomintang, a role which enabled him to promote the career of Mao Zedong and of Chu Enlai. However, having suspected Borodan Grusenberg of engaging in subversive work, Chiang Kai-shek expelled him from China in 1927. Returning to the USSR, he passed unharmed the year 1937. During the war with Germany, we find him editor-in-chief of the Soviet Information Office alongside Dridzo Lozovsky. Lozovsky. He will be executed in 1951. About the Bolshevik Jews executed in the 1930s, See Infra, Chapter 19, Infra meaning below, 
among them also, these are Jews who were abroad and were, came back to help the revolution or represent it somehow. Also among them, Samuel Agursky, A-G-U-R-S-K-Y, who became one of the leaders of Belarus. Arrested in 1938, he served a sentence of deportation. He is the father of the late Emma Gursky, who prematurely disappeared and who did not follow the same path as his progenitor, far from it. Let us also mention Solomon Slipak, an influential member of the Comintern. He returned to Russia by Vladivostok, where he took part in assassinations. He then went to China to try to attract Sun Yat-sen in an alliance with communism. His son Vladimir would have to tear himself, not without a clash, from the trap into which his father had fallen in his quest for the radiant future of communism. Stories like this, and some even more paradoxical, there are hundreds of them. Demolishers of the bourgeois, quote-unquote, Jewish culture also turned up, among them the collaborators of S. Diamondstein in the European Commissariat, the S. R. Dobkovsky, Agursky already mentioned, and also, quote, Cantor, Shapiro, Kaplan, former emigrant anarchist who had returned from London and New York, unquote. The objective of the commissariat was to create a, quote, center for the Jewish communist movement. In August 1918, the new communist newspaper in Yiddish, or MS, E-M-E-S, The Truth, announced, quote, the proletarian revolution began in the streets of the Jews. A campaign was immediately launched against the haters and the Talmud Torah, that's the Jewish educational school, the hater, in June 1919, countersigned by Essa Gursky and Stalin, the dissolution of the Central Bureau of the Jewish Communities was proclaimed, which represented the conservative faction of Judaism, fraction of Judaism, the one that had not sided with the Bolsheviks. End of section, new section. It is nonetheless true that the socialist Jews were not attracted primarily to the Bolsheviks. Now, however, where were the other parties? What had become of them? What allowed the Bolshevik party to occupy an exclusive position? What had allowed the, what allowed the Bolshevik party to occupy an exclusive position was the disintegration of the old Jewish political parties. Well, isn't that funny? The Boon, the Zionist socialist, the Zionist, the Poali had split up and their leaders had joined the victor's camp by denying the ideals of democratic socialism, such as M. Reyes, M. Frumkina, Esther, A. Weinstein, and M. Litvinov. So the appearance of diversity, but the reality of one agenda, one party, one tribe, one race. Moving on to 480. Is it possible, even the boon, this extremely belligerent organization to which even Lenin's positions were not suitable, which showed itself so intransigent on the principle of cultural and national autonomy on the Jews, could that even fold and just become part of the communists? Well, yes, even the boon. After the establishment of Soviet power, the leadership of the boon in Russia split into two groups. 1920, the right, which in its majority emigrated, and the left, which liquidated the boon, 1921, and adhered in large part to the Bolshevik party. Among the former members of the boon, we can cite the irremovable David Zaslavsky, the one who for decades would put his pen at the service of Stalin, he would be responsible for stigmatizing Mandelstam and Pasternak, also the Leplevsky brothers, Israel and Grigori, one from the outset would become an agent of the Cheka and stay there for the rest of his life, the other would occupy a high position in the NKVD in 1920, then would be Deputy Commissar of the People, President of the small Sovnarkom of the RSFSR, then Deputy Attorney General of the USSR, 1934-1939. He would be a victim of repression in 1939. Solomon Kotliar immediately promoted First Secretary of Orthborg of Vologda of Tver of the regional committee of Orel, were also Abraham Heifetz. He returned to Russia after February 1917, joined the presidium of the Boon's main committee in Ukraine, was a member of the central committee of the Boon. In October 1917, he was already for the Bolsheviks, and in 1919, he figured in the leading group of the Comintern. 
to the leftists of the boon join the left of the Zionist Socialists and the SERP, those entered the Communist Party as early as 1919. The left wing of the Poli Zion did the same in 1921. In 1926, according to an internal census, there were up to 2,500 former members of the boon in the party. It goes without saying that many, later on, fell under the blade. Quote, under Stalin, the majority of them were victims of ferocious persecutions. Beekerman exclaims, The Bund, which had assumed the role of representative of the Jewish working masses, joined the Bolsheviks in its most important and active part. In his memoirs, David Asbel, A-Z-B-E-L, tries to explain the reasons for the succession by reflecting on the example of his uncle, Aaron Isaacievich Weinstein, an influential member of the boon that we mentioned above. Quote, he had understood before all others that his party, as well as other social parties, were condemned. He had also understood an, another thing. To survive and continue to defend the interests of the Jews would be possible only by joining the Bolsheviks. For how many of them the reasons, one, survive, two, continue to defend the interests of the Jews, were decisive. Tentatively, both objectives were achieved. It will note also that after October, the other socialist parties, the SR and the Mensheviks, who, as we know, had a large number of Jews in their ranks and at their heads, did not stand up against Bolshevism either. Scarcely aware of the fact that the Bolsheviks had dismissed this constituent assembly which they had called for, they withdrew, hesitated, divided themselves in their turn, sometimes proclaiming their neutrality in the Civil War, other times their intention to temporize. As for the SR, they downright opposed the They downright opened to the Bolsheviks a portion of the Eastern Front and tried to demoralize the rear of the whites. And white Russians, the ones fighting back against the revolution. But we also find Jews among the leaders of the resistance to the Bolsheviks in 1918. Out of the 26 signatures of the, quote, open letter of prisoners on the affair of the Workers' Congress, unquote, written at Taganka Prison, no less than a quarter are Jewish. The Bolsheviks were pitiless toward the Mensheviks of this kind. In the summer of 1918, R. Abramovich, an important Menshevik leader, avoided execution only by means of a letter addressed to Lenin from an Austrian prison by Friedrich Adler, the one who had shot down the Austrian prime minister in 1916 and who had been reprieved. Others, too, were stoic. Gregory Binchtok, Semyon Weinstein, arrested several times. They were eventually expelled from the country. In February 1921, in Petrograd, the Mensheviks certainly supported the deceived and hungry workers. They pushed them to protest and strike, but without any real conviction, and they lacked audacity to take the lead of the Kronstadt insurrection. However, this did not in any way protect them from repression. We also know a lot of Mensheviks who joined the Bolsheviks, who exchanged one party label for another. They were Boris Magwidov, he became head of the political section in the 10th Army, then Donbass, secretary of the provincial committees of Poltava, Samara, instructor on the Central Committee. Abram Deborine, a true defector, he rapidly climbed the echelons of a career of, quote, red professor, unquote, stuffing our heads with dialectical materialism and historical materialism. Alexander Goikbarg, mem member of the Soviet Revolutionary Committee, public prosecutor at the trial of the ministers of Kolchak, member of the College of the Commissariat for Justice, then president of the Little Sovnarkom. Some of them held out for some time until their arrests, such as I. Likovetsky, Maisky. The others, in great numbers, were reduced very early to silence from the trial of the imaginary, quote, Unified Menshevik Bureau, unquote, of 1931, where we find Guimer Sukhanov, who was the designer of the tactics of the executive committee in March 1917. A huge raid was organized throughout the Union to apprehend them. 
there were defectors in the SR. Lakov Lifshitz, for example, vice president of the Chernigov Cheka in 1919, then Kharkov, then president of the Kiev Cheka, and at the height of a rapid career, vice president of the Ukrainian GPU. There was anarchist communist, the most famous being Lazar Kogund, special section of the armies, assistant to the chief of army of the V Cheka in 1930, senior official of the Gulag and, in 1931, chief of the White Sea shipyard of the NKVD. There are extremely sinuous biographies, Ilya Kit Vitenko, a lieutenant in the Austrian army, taken prisoner by the Russians and from the moment of the Bolsheviks are in power, takes his ranks at the Cheka Guepio and then in the army and in the 1930s was one of the reformers of the Red Army and then in the whole for 20 years. And what about the Zionists? Let us remember, in 1906, they had posited and proclaimed that they could not stay away from the Russians' fight against the yoke of autocracy, and they had actively engaged in the said battle. This did not prevent them in May 1918, when the yoke still weighed so heavily, to declare that, in matters of Russian domestic policy, they would henceforth be neutral, quote, very obviously in the hope of avoiding the risk, unquote, that the Bolsheviks, quote, would accuse them of being counter-revolutionaries. And at first, it worked. Throughout the year 1918 and during the first six months of 1919, the Bolsheviks left them alone, the Zionists. In the summer of 1918, they were able to hold the All-Russian Congress of Jewish Communities in Moscow, and hundreds of these communities had their, quote, Palestinian week, unquote. Their newspapers appeared freely in a youth club. The Herolutes was created. But in the spring of 1919, local authorities undertook to ban the Zionist press here and there, and in the autumn of 1919, a few prominent figures were accused of, quote, espionage for the benefit of England. In the spring of 1920, the Zionists organized a pan-Russian conference in Moscow. Result, all the participants, 90 people, were interned in the Butyrka prison. Some were condemned, but the penalty was not applied following the intervention of a delegation of Jewish syndicates from America. The Vicheka Presidium declared that the Zionist organization was counter-revolutionary and its activity was now forbidden in Soviet Russia. From this moment began the era of clandestinity for the Zionists. M. Heifetz, who is a thoughtful man, reminds us very well of this. Did the October coup not coincide exactly with the Balfour Declaration, which laid the foundations of an independent Jewish state? Well, what happened? Quote, a part of the new Jewish generation followed the path of Herzl and Jabotinsky, while the other part, let us be precise, the biggest part, yielded to temptation and swelled the ranks of the Lenin-Trotsky-Stalin band, exactly what Churchill feared. Quote, Herzl's way then appeared distant, unreal, while that of Trotsky and Bagritsky enabled the Jews to gain immediate stature and immediately become a nation in Russia, equal in right and even privileged. Close quote. Also defector, of course, and not least, Lev Miklis of the Polite Scion, his career is well known, in Stalin's secretariat in the editorial board of the Pravda at the head of the Red Army's political sector, in the State Defense Commissariat and Commissioner of the State Control. It was he who made our landing in Crimea in 1942 fail, at the height of his career, in the Org Bureau of the Central Committee. His ashes are sealed in the wall of the Kremlin. He's given the CV for all these prominent Bolsheviks. That was Lev Meklis, M-E-K-H-L-I-S. His ashes are sealed in the wall of the Kremlin as we move on to 483. Of course, there was an important part of the Jews of Russia who did not appear to adhere to Bolshevism, neither the rabbis, the lecturers, nor the great doctors, nor a whole mass of good people fell into the arms of the Bolsheviks. Tirkova writes in the same passage in her book a few lines later, this predominance of the Jews among the Soviet leaders put to despair those of the Russian Jews who, despite the cruel iniquity suffered under the Tsarist regime, regarded Russia as the motherland and led the common life of all Russian intelligentsia, refusing, in communion with her, 
any collaboration with the Bolsheviks. But at the time, they had no opportunity of making themselves heard publicly, and these pages are naturally not filled with their names, but those of the conquerors, those who have bridled the course of events. A horse bridle and rode it. Two illustrious terrorist acts perpetrated by Jewish arms against the Bolsheviks in 1918 occupy a special place. The assassination of Uritsky by Leonid Kanegisser and the attack on Lenin by Fanny Kaplan. Here too, though, the other way around was expressed the vocation of the Jewish people to be always among the first. Perhaps the blows fired at Lenin were rather the result of SR intentions. But as for Kanegisser, born of hereditary nobility by his grandfather, he entered the School of Officer Cadets in 1917. By the way, he was in friendly relations with Sergei Yesenin. I admit full well Mark Aldenov's explanation. Quote, in the face of the Russian people in history, he was moved by the desire to oppose the names of Yuritsky and Zanoviev with another Jewish name. This is the feeling he expresses in a note transmitted to his sister on the eve of the attack, in which he says he wants to avenge the peace of Brest-Litovsk, that he is ashamed to see the Jews contribute to install the Bolsheviks in power, and also avenge the execution of his companion of the School of Artillery at the Cheka of Petrograd. So a couple of Jew loyalists who are opposed to Bolshevism don't like that Russia is being sold out. It should, not, it should be noted, however, that recent studies have revealed that these two attacks were perpetrated under suspicious circumstances. There is strong presumption that Fanny Kaplan did not shoot Lenin at all, but was apprehended, quote, to close the case, unquote, a convenient culprit by chance. There is also a hypothesis that the Bolshevik authorities themselves would have created the necessary conditions for Kanegisser to fire his shot. This I strongly doubt, says Solzhenitsyn, for what provocation would the Bolsheviks have sacrificed their beloved child, president of the Cheka? One thing, however, is troubling. How is it that later, in full red terror, when was attained by force of arms throughout the entire country, thousands of innocent hostages, totally unconnected with the affair, the whole Kanegisser family was freed from prison and allowed to emigrate? We do not recognize here the Bolshevik claw, or would it be the intervention of a very long arm to the highest-ranking Soviet instances? A recent publication tells us that the relatives and friends of L. Kanegis, or K-A-N-E, German type name, K-A-N-N-E, G-I-S-S-E-R, that relatives and friends of L. Kanegis, or had even drawn up an armed attack plan against the Cheka of Petrograd to free their prisoner, and that all, as soon as they were arrested, were released and remained in Petrograd without being disturbed. Such clemency on the part of the Bolshevik authorities may be explained by their concern to avoid ill feelings with the influential Jewish circles in Petrograd. The Kanegisser family had kept its Judaic faith, and Leonid's mother, Rosalia <coughs> Eduardovna, declared during an interrogation that her son had fired on Yuritsky because, quote, he had turned away from Judaism. But here is a Jewish name that has not yet obtained the deserved celebrity, Alexander Abramovich Vilenkin, hero of the clandestine V I L E N K I N, hero of the clandestine struggle against the Bolsheviks. He was a volunteer in the Hussars at the age of 17. In 1914, he was decorated four times with the Cross of St. George, promoted to officer, then, on the eve of the revolution, he became a captain of cavalry. cavalry. In 1918, he joined the clandestine organization Union for the Defense of the Homeland and of Liberty. He was apprehended by the Cheka at the time when, as the organization had been discovered, he was delaying the destruction of compromising documents. Focused, intelligent, energetic, uncompromising toward the Bolsheviks, he infused in others the spirit of resistance. Executed by the Bolsheviks, it goes without saying. The information about him came to us from his comrade in arms of the underground in 1918 and also from his cellmate in 1919, Vasily Fyodorovich Klementiev, captain in the Russian army. These fighters against Bolshevism, whatever their motivations, we venerate their memory as Jews. We regret that they were so few, as were too few the white forces during the Civil War. <clears throat> 
So, you know, he goes out of his way to talk about any Jew that could be claimed to be a true Russian nationalist and actually support the good guys. But he doesn't really go enough into Jews being the bad guys, in my view. In my view. And he's already made his, he started with the generalization that is false, that this was not a Jewish revolution, but a Russian one. Wrong. New section. A very prosaic and entirely new phenomenon reinforced the victory of the Bolsheviks. These occupied important positions from which many advantages resulted, notably the enjoyment in both capitals of, quote, vacant, unquote, apartments freed by their owners, quote, former aristocrats, now in the run. So the Bolshevs stole the apartments of the former uh, white nobles and fed them to their Jew relatives. In these apartments could live a whole tributary flock of the former Pale of Settlement. This was a real exodus, quote-unquote. One of the few times he almost makes a joke. G.A. Landau writes, The Jews have climbed the stairs of power and occupied a few summits. From there, it is normal that they brought, as they do everywhere in any environment, their relatives, friends, companions from their youth. A perfectly natural process. The granting of functions to people who are known, trusted, protected, or simply begging for your favors. This process multiplied the number of Jews in the Soviet state apparatus. We will not say how many Zinoviev's wife, Lilina, thus brought parents and relatives, nor how Zinoviev distributed positions to his own. They are the focus, but the influx, not to have been noticed at the moment, was enormous and concerns tens of thousands of people. The people transmigrated en masse from Odessa to Moscow. Is it known that Trotsky himself gratified his father, whom he moderately loved, of a Sovkhoz in the suburbs of Moscow. I don't know what a Sovkhoz is, but it sounds probably a nice house. These migrations can be followed throughout biographies, so that of David, not to be confused with Mark Asbel, in 1919, still a kid, he left Chemigov, where he was born, to come to Moscow, where his two aunts already lived. His first li- He first lived in the house of one of them, Ida, a wealthy merchant of the First Guild, whose husband had returned from America, and then with the other, Leolia, who was housed in the first house of the Soviets, capital FHS, called the National, the first house of the Soviets, with all the best of the Soviet Union. Their neighbor Ulrich, who would later become famous, said jokingly, quote, why don't we open a synagogue in the National where only Jews live? A whole Soviet elite then left St. Petersburg to settle in the second house of the Soviets, the Metropolis, in the third, the seminary, Bojadomsky Street, in the fourth, Mokhavaya, Vajvijenka Street, and in the fifth, Cherametievsky Street. These tenants receive from a special distribution center abundant parcels. Quote, caviar, cheese, butter, smoked sturgeon were never lacking on their table. And in parentheses, we are in 1920 when people are in bread lines. Everything was special, designed especially for the new elite. Kindergartens, schools, clubs, libraries. In 1921-22, the year of the murderous famine on the Volga and the help of Tara in their, quote, model school, the canteen was fed by the ARA Foundation and served American breakfast, rice pudding, hot chocolate, white bread, and fried eggs. And, quote, no one remembered that the day before it was vociferated in the classrooms that the bourgeois should be hung high on the lantern. Saying one thing, doing another. It is the Jewish way. Quote, the children of the neighboring houses hated those of the Soviet houses, so-called, capital S and H, and at the first opportunity went after them. The NEP came, the New Economic Policy, The tenants of the National then moved into cozy apartments or pavilions that had previously belonged to aristocrats or bourgeois. In 1921, quote, spend the summer in Moscow where you suffocate? No, you are invited to an old mansion, now confiscated, in the outskirts of Moscow. There, quote, everything is in the state, as in the days of the former owners, except that high fences are erected around these houses and that guards are posted at the entrance. Wives of the commissioners began to frequent the best spas of the West. We see the development, owed to the scarcity of food, of misery and the concealment of foodstuffs, a secondhand trade and a whole traffic of goods. Quote, 
having bought for peanuts an entire lot of commodities from emigrating merchants, Aunt Ida and Uncle Misha sold them under the table and thus became, quote, probably the richest people in all of Moscow, unquote. However, in 1926, they were sentenced to five years' imprisonment for, quote, economic counter-revolution, unquote, to which were added, at the end of the NEP, ten years of camp. Let us also quote, quote, When the Bolsheviks became the government, all sorts of individuals from the Jewish sub-proletariat joined them, wishing to get their share, unquote. And as free trade and private enterprise were forbidden, many Jewish families saw their daily lives greatly modified. Quote, the middle-aged people were mostly deprived, while the younger ones, rid of all spiritual ballast, by having social careers, were able to maintain their elders. Hence the excessive number of Jews in the Soviet state apparatus. Close quote. Note, the author does not justify this process by calling it a unique issue, but he notes with grief the aspect that counts. Quote, this destructive process did not meet the resistance it would have required in the Jewish milieu. On the contrary, it found their, quote, voluntary executants and a climate of sympathy. Jews are only too happy to steal from others. It is thus that many Jews entered the Soviet ruling class. But could this process, however occult as it was, go unnoticed by the disadvantaged Russian social strata, the people waiting in the breadlines without jobs. And how could the man in the street react, either by jeers, quote, Rosa of the Sovnarkas, the husband of Kaika of the Cheka, or by funny stories from those that flooded Russia as early as 1918, Vysotsky tea, Brodsky sugar, Trotsky Russia. And in Ukraine it gave, hop, harvest workers, all Jews are bosses and they began to whisper a new slogan, quote, the Soviets without the Jews, unquote. The co-authors of the Book of Russia and the Jews became alarmed in 1924. It is clear that, quote, not all Jews are Bolsheviks, and all Bolsheviks are not Jews, but there is no need to prove today to prove the zealous participation of the Jews in the martyrdom imposed on an exsanguinate Russia that is a bled dry by the Bolsheviks. What we must, on the contrary, is try to elucidate in a calm manner how this work of destruction was refracted in the consciousness of the Russian people. The Russians had never seen any Jews in command before. They now saw them today at every step, invested with a ferocious and unlimited power. Quote, to answer the question of Judaism's responsibility in the emergence of Bolshevik Jews, we must first consider the psychology of non-Jews that, of all these Russians who suffer directly from the atrocities committed, the Jewish actors of public life who wish to prevent any new bloody tra tragedy to save the Jews of Russia from new pogroms must take account of this fact. We must, quote, understand the psychology of the Russians who suddenly found themselves under the authority of an evil, arrogant, rude, self-confident, and impudent brood. Close quote. Move on to 487. It is not for the purpose of settling accounts that we must remember history, nor to reassume mutual accusations, but to understand how, for example, it was possible for important layers of a perfectly correct Jewish society to have tolerated an enormous participation of Jews in the rise, 1918, of a state that was not only insensitive to the Russian people, foreign to Russian history, but which, moreover, inflicted on the population all the outbursts of terror. In italics. The presence of Jews alongside the Bolsheviks raises questions not because it would induce a foreign origin to this power. When we speak of the abundance of Jewish names in revolutionary Russia, we paint a picture of nothing new. How many Germanic and Baltic names have figured for a century and a half to two centuries in the Tsarist administration? Many, but they weren't killing people. The real question is, in what direction did this power work? Is what did they do with the power? D.S. Pasmanic, however, gives us this reflection, quote, Let all the Russians who are capable of reflecting ask themselves whether Bolshevism, even with Lenin at its head, would have triumphed if there had been in Soviet Russia a satisfied and educated peasantry owning land. Could all the, quote, sages of Zion gathered together, even with a Trotsky at their head, be able to bring about the great chaos in Russia, 
unquote. He is right. They could never have done so. Well, they did it in other countries, so I'd say they could have done so. They did it in America, right? But the first to ask the question should be the Jews more than the Russians. This episode of history should call out to them today. Again, he just is positing that Jews are the same as whites and that they feel guilty and they have conscience. He, he doesn't even bother to study their own religion and find out that they don't even see non-Jews as humans. Or if he knows that, as I'm sure he's, he is aware of it as an idea, he doesn't care. He rejects it for his own Christian ideology. The question of the mass participation of the Jews in the Bolshevik administration and the atrocities committed by the Jews should be elucidated in a spirit of far-sighted analysis of history. It is not admissible to evade the question by saying, it was the scum, the renegades of Judaism. We do not have to answer for them. Well, but he's already said it himself. He's calling them all renegades rather than just ordinary Jews. The majority can't be renegades. That's not what renegade means. D.S. Chiturman is right to remind me of my own remarks about the communist leaders of any nation. Quote, they have all turned away from their people and poured into the inhuman. I believe it. But Pazmanic was right to write in the 20s, quote, we cannot confine ourselves to saying that the Jewish people do not answer for the acts committed by one or other of its members. We answer for Trotsky as long as we are not dissociated ourselves from him, said Pazmanic. Now, to disassociate oneself does not mean to turn away. On the contrary, it means rejecting actions to the end and learning from them. I have studied Trotsky's biography extensively, and I agree that he did not have any specifically Jewish attachments, but was rather a fanatical internationalist. Does this mean that a compatriot like him is easier to incriminate than the others? But as soon as his star rose in the autumn of 1917, Trotsky became, for far too many people, a subject of pride, and for the radical left of the Jews of America, a true idol, and still the idol of the neocons today, as they mung about and try to draw us into a war with Russia over the Ukraine. Moving on to 488, what can I say of America, but of everywhere else as well? There was a young man in the camp where I was interned in the 50s, Vladimir Gershuni, a fervent socialist and internationalist who had kept a full conscious conscience of his Jewishness. I saw him again in the 60s after our release and he gave me his notes. I read there that Trotsky was the Prometheus of October for the sole reason that he was Jewish. So he's saying that even though he studies Trotsky's bio and sees him just basically as an internationalist, yet this Jew he was in the camp with gives him his notes and he says, to him, the point is that the whole point is Trotsky is Jewish, quote from the notes. He was a Prometheus, not because he was born such, but because he was a child of the Prometheus people. This people who, if it was not attached to the rock of obtuse wickedness by the chains of a patent and latent hostility, would have done much more than he did for the good of humanity. Quote, all historians who deny the participation of Jews in the revolution tend not to recognize in these Jews their national character, and that should be their race. Those, on the contrary, and especially Israeli historians who see Jewish hegemony as a victory of the Judaic spirit, those ones exalt their belonging to Jewishness. It was as early as the, as the 20s, when the Civil War ended, that the arguments were made to exonerate the Jews. I.O. Levin reviews them in the collection Russia and the Jews. The Bolshevik Jews were not so numerous as that. There is no reason why a whole people should respond to the acts of a few. The Jews were persecuted in Tsarist Russia. All the reasons are given that Jews can't be blamed. During the Civil War, the Jews had to flee the pogroms by seeking refuge with the Bolsheviks, etc. And he rejected them by arguing that it was not a matter of criminal responsibility, which is always individual, but a moral responsibility. Pasmanic thought it impossible to be relieved of a moral responsibility, but he consoled himself by saying, quote, Why should the mass of the Jewish people answer for the turpitudes of certain commissioners? It is profoundly unjust. However, to admit that there is a collective responsibility for the Jews is to recognize the existence of a Jewish nation of its own. From the moment when the Jews cease to be a nation, from the day when they are Russians, Germans, Englishmen of Judaic confession, it is then that they will shake off the shackles of collective responsibility. 
Now, the 20th century has rightly taught us to recognize the Hebrew nation as such with its anchorage in Israel. And the collective responsibility of a people, of the Russian people too, of course, is inseparable from its capacity to build a morally worthy life. And yet Jews have a different morality. There's not one morality. Jews have a different morality from what Christians have and what other people have. Yes, they are abounding the arguments that explain why the Jews stood by the Bolsheviks, and we will discuss others very solid when we talk about the Civil War. Nevertheless, if the Jews of Russia remember this period only to justify themselves, it will mean that their level of national consciousness has fallen, that this consciousness will have lost itself. The Germans could also challenge their responsibility for the Nazi period by saying, they were not real Germans, they were the dregs of society, they did not ask for our opinion, but this people answers for its past, even in its ignominious periods. Again, you see that he, Solzhenitsyn is simply a Christian, it is most basically he's simply a Christian conservative, going along with the party line that uh, National Socialism was bad and that Nazis were evil. By endeavoring to conscientize it, to understand it, how did such a thing happen, where lies our fault, is there a danger that this will happen again? Yet again, so he's, he's completely mainstream. He's unwilling to question that the Nazis were the bad guys. It is in this spirit that the Jewish people must respond to their revolutionary assassins, as well as the columns of well-disposed individuals who put themselves at their service. It is not a question here of answering before other peoples, but before oneself, before one's conscience, and before God. As we Russians must answer, both for the pogroms and our incendiary, like you can compare a few dozen people being killed versus tens of millions, and our incendiary peasants, insensible to all pity, and for our red soldiers who have fallen into madness, and our sailors transformed into wild beasts. I have spoken of them with enough depth, I believe, in the red wheel, and I will add an example here. The Red Guard, A.R. Basov, B-A-S-S-O-V, in charge of escorting Shingaryov, this man passionate of justice, a popular intercessor, began by collecting money from the sister of the prisoner as a tip to finance his transfer from the Peter and Paul Fortress to the Mariinsky Hospital, and a few hours later, in the same night, he leads the hospital, some sailors who coldly shoot down Shingaryov and Kokochi. In this individual, so many homegrown traits. Answer, yes, as one answers for a member of one's family, is what he's saying the Jews must do. But he refuses to take Judaism for what it is, is my final conclusion. In the last, the last paragraph, for if we are absolved of all responsibility for the actions of our compatriots, it is the very notion of nation which then loses all true meaning. Are people, are Jews simply people who are acting badly, or are they a race that uh, simply has certain traits? I, I think the answer is obvious that you got to look at Jews biologically, not religiously. Anyway, that ends chapter 15. And I don't know. I'm, I have mixed feelings about him. He's He, he puts out a lot of good information, but it, he, again, it's similar to E. Michael Jones, although I, I think he's less interesting than Jones. He doesn't interpret it properly. He just interprets it in the standard conservative way. He's unwilling to actually question, are Jews a religion or are they a race? Which is a better explanation of them? Which has more predictive power? And you look through history and, you know, we've answered, we've answered the Christian Def, ideological definition of what Jews are by pointing out they acted the same before Christianity was ever around, before Jesus was ever around. We pointed out the other people reject Jesus and they don't act like Jews. So there's something about Jews that is, their behavior is every bit as definite as their ear confirmation, which is a way that uh, one of the set, set piece mockings that the Catholics have for uh, mocking a physical characteristics of being insignificant but in fact, they're very significant. The National Socialists figured that out, and they actually got their race, their portion of the race, turned around and headed in the right direction. And that is why they are regarded as the ultimate evil. And anyone who plays along with that characterization, as Solzhenitsyn does, whether he's Russian or English, is effectively aiding 
the Jewish race. Thanks for being with me today. I'm Alex Linder reading to you out of Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together. This was recording number 23, and I'll be back with you again real, real soon.